Okay, I'm going to start the meeting. Welcome to the February 2022 meeting of the Miami Pioneers and Natives of Dade. This is the first Sunday of February 2022, and we're happy to see some friends gathering here together for what I think is going to be a wonderful program. And today our guest is Bonnie Cialino, and she is the South Florida Collections Management Center archivist for the National Park Service down at, uh, at Everglades National Park. And so uh, Bonnie is uh, responsible for managing uh, the archival collections for the five National Park Service units in Southern portion of Florida. She'll tell us about that. And she also works to provide access points to Park Service collections and to support the research related to the South Florida parks and to mentor developing archival professionals. Now, following her completion of her Master of Arts degree at Texas Tech University, she developed a passion for serving the public as a National Park Service employee, sharing information about the Everglades region and about the National Park Service. She's the proud mother of an energetic nine-year-old and derives most uh, life satisfaction of creating a meal to share with loved ones. Isn't that lovely? And I think uh, probably a few of our friends here online share a similar passion of uh, enjoying cooking a nice meal. And so uh, uh, now we'll turn over the program to Bonnie and she will begin to share with us her presentation about the National Park Service archives and collection. Bonnie, it's so nice to have you with us today. And you can turn on your microphone. There you go. See, boom, she knows what she's doing. And uh, say hello to everybody and, and uh, tell us a little more about yourself, something. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. Um, I had the opportunity yesterday to... Uh, spend a few minutes out with my my little guy yesterday we found a really cool um you pick um field so we got some fresh eggplant and strawberries so i've got some eggplant parm a going and we're gonna have nice. uh, vanilla cake with fresh strawberries for dinner tonight so um that's uh made a really really nice weekend and um this is wonderful um to be here with you to share a little bit about what we do and uh why we do what we do um, so I will work on getting my screen shared and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I do find it usually easier to answer questions as you go along, um, or I'm sorry, at the end. Um, but if there's something that is really relevant to a particular um, slide that I'm on, feel free to, to chime in and, um, and ask away. Um, I try to be as adaptable as possible. All right, let's see if I can get this screen sharing set. And while Bonnie's getting that ready, remember you can open your chat window and you can, uh, you can post some questions in there or ask uh, something or make a comment. And, uh, and, and those will be saved later with the recording. And then, or if, if Bonnie wants to share a link with us at the end of her presentation of where we can find more, things like that, we'll put that in the chat window. So, uh, so be aware of that, that'll give you a little extra information about what's going on. Okay, can see, you I see we're see just about screen? ready for opening those closed doors now. So Bonnie, great. please take it away. We look forward to your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And you can all hear me okay, correct? All right. Awesome. Um, once again, my name is Bonnie Cialino. I'm the archivist for the South Florida Collections Management Center. We're physically located in Everglades National Park. Uh, but we're responsible for serving the five National Park Service units in the southern portion of Florida. As you can see from the map, it is a significant amount of space um, that we are responsible for providing collections care and coverage for. Um, our smallest little park is DeSoto National Memorial, which is in Bradenton uh, near Tampa. So people don't always think of it as South Florida, but we embrace them with a lot of love. Uh, so if you're ever interested in learning more about any of the parks that we serve, uh, we like to be a resource uh, to our users. One of the questions that I get most frequently is, what exactly do you do back there? Well, we're here today to talk about it. Our job involves collecting, preserving, studying and interpreting, providing access, and um, making sure that the collections that we hold on behalf of the American people 
are accessible to the public. All of our collections actually mirror the mission of each of the parks that we serve. We work under something called a collections management statement. And that uh, collections management statement mirrors the mission of the park. So the reason that it was established is um, directly related to the type of materials that we collect. So let's draw back a little bit and start thinking about what exactly is a museum. In 1895, George Brown Good defined a museum as an institution for the preservation of those objects which best illustrate the phenomenon of nature, the works of man, and the utilization of these for the increase in knowledge of the people. Some of the images that I'm sharing on the screen right now come from our collections from Biscayne National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve, just to indicate how different dolls can be from different cultures. The figures at the top are from some from of the Spanish shipwrecks that were located off the coast of Biscayne National Park. And of course, at the bottom, a gorgeous little Mikasuki's uh, seminal artwork doll. So when the idea of museums was first developing, very early on, people would collect things that fascinated them. And the concept of the cabinet of curiosity developed. And I love this image of just a cabinet full of things that are interesting. These um, corals actually look somewhat like some of the collections that we maintain. But how does that exactly relate to the National Park Service? Well, the first NPS director, Stephen Mather, said that one of the most important matters to receive earnest consideration is the early establishment of adequate museums in every one of our parks. Now that is a tremendous undertaking because managing just one museum is an enormous, enormous task. It requires a lot of detail and requires a lot of research and requires a lot of painstaking management so that we can ensure that the collections that we hold in our custody are maintained in perpetuity. So that word in perpetuity is something that really resonates for us because we are tasked with trying to make sure that these things last as long as they possibly can. And that isn't always easy because we're working against the forces of deterioration, which are inherent in everything that was living at one point in time. Also related to the development of NPS museums, the Secretary of the Interior, so this was rising to the very high levels as the NPS was being developed and more and more NPS units were being added to the agency. Secretary of the Interior Franklin Lane said, museums containing specimens of wildflowers, shrubs, and trees, and mounted animals, birds and fish native to the parks, and other exhibits of this character will be established as authorized. So the authorization of a museum as a park was being established. So this was tied to the very, very early establishment legislation for each of the park service units that are part of the NPS. We operate under five general legal authorities um, for the National Park Service to hold museum collections. We have a lot of really strict uh, legal requirements for ownership and possession of museum collections. I won't read these all off to you right now, but the Antiquities Act, we're talking about some of our historic items. Organic Act, we're talking about some of our natural history collections, our historic buildings, I don't know if any of you have ever been out to Fort Jefferson, um, but we certainly do have responsibilities associated with Fort Jeff. Um, archaeological resources. So that gives you a sense of the types of materials that we collect and maintain in the NPS collections. So as I mentioned, as the parks were being established, I think we're over 400 
16 at this point, but there are at least 388 parks that maintain museum collections throughout the United States. So just in South Florida region, the five NPS units down here have their own unique museum collections. And that's what I get to play with every day. Um, but across the United States, there are over 45 million natural, historic, prehistoric objects and over 75,000 linear feet of archives to help tell the story of the United States and preserve the history for the American people. If you're ever interested in learning more about the different museum collections that are out there and have virtual exhibits that you can explore from the comfort of your living room, you can simply Google the NPS Museum Management Program and look for the, some of those virtual exhibits. And this image right down here is from the virtual exhibit that we have for Everglades National Park of the first day covers, the first day of release uh, postage stamp. Uh, that you could see down in the bottom right hand corner was released at the time of the dedication of Everglades National Park. And when uh, people purchased a, a, a sheet of these stamps, they came in an envelope that had really beautiful, unique decoration and illustrations and designs. So this is a fun little exhibit if you're interested in exploring a little bit after. And I just love this gator. He's looking really happy and smiling right there. So we have these things, we collect them, they relate to the parks that we manage, but well, you know, what do you do with stuff if you're keeping stuff? It's gotta be used, right? Um, well, one of the ways that we engage with collections use is we have scientists come and use our collections for their studies. We have historians, archeologists, even our park managers will come back to our collections, particularly our archives and say, oh gosh, we have this issue going on right now, but what did we do about this 30 years ago and how does it relate to what we're thinking about now? And so our collections are really, really useful for making park management decisions in that capacity. Sometimes our collections are featured in social media um, products, videos, social media sites, documentaries, a variety of other formats. Uh, we do have some collection items on exhibit in our visitor centers. And we also work with our park interpreters to help develop educational programs. Um, and we also partner with several digital repositories, which are helping us to provide better access via internet um, communication strategies. So I mentioned a little bit earlier this word perpetuity. And the, the work that we do as um, curatorial staff is, is really, an, it's a, I consider it an art form. It's something that people go into a museum and they pull out some drawers and they say, wow, that's really cool. Unfortunately, when we receive the collections, they don't always look like this. <laughs> and so um, we do engage in a lot of painstaking painstaking work to make sure that our collections are housed in a way that will ensure its protection and longevity. But before we even get to that point, we have to decide what we're going to keep. And so we have a guiding document that's called a scope of collection statement. And again, that scope of collection statement ties right back to the mission of the park. So our collections range depending upon why the park that we're collecting for was established. So if you think about Everglades National Park, we think about the wilderness and we think about the wildlife and we think about the diversity of life represented. So in our Everglades collections, our natural history collections are much more prolific than our cultural history collections. That being said, we're actually spending more time now doing research about the cultural history of Everglades National Park, trying to make the connection between people who've lived in the park over the years and how they've used it and what that has meant for the park as it's grown and developed over time. So we have a really heavy natural history focus based in Everglades National Park, but then we also manage collections for Dry Tortugas National Park, which is a Civil War era fort um, out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. So in those collections, we have a much, much stronger uh, cultural history collection 
pertaining to artifacts that were originally part of the fort. So this is where we find our cannons and our cannonballs and um, information about the construction of the fort and the materials that were used to do so. So it, uh, like I said, depending upon why the park was established to begin with, really helps drive what we collect to tell the story of that park. So I'm talking about all these terms and I should have gotten into this in more detail before throwing them out and making comparisons, but I'll elaborate a little bit for you. So when I say something along the lines of natural history collections, I'm talking about biological specimens, biological mounts, geological specimens, paleontological specimens. Um, down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see one of our pressed herbarium specimens. Um, immediately to its right is the first specimen of the lionfish that was collected in Biscayne National Park. Uh, that was circa 2008 or 2009. And we know that the lionfish population has grown pretty significantly despite efforts to try to manage that population within the park. We have pinned um, insect collections. Uh, one of our good friends, Mr. Mosquito, hanging out right there. And uh, we also have some taxidermy collections as well, as you can see by the, the little bird on the, uh, the bottom right there. Here's just a few more images of items from our collections. The item in the center left is a taxidermied Florida panther. And this particular specimen is over 100 years old. He's a little awkward, a little gangly, uh, because he was originally mounted over 100 years ago by an amateur taxidermist named Dr. John Dupuy. And Dr. Dupuy actually wrote about the night that he encountered this cat and brought it into his possession. Uh, we had the opportunity to do a little bit more research about this particular specimen because we wanted to know how it was mounted. And we also were concerned because the pelt is in such good shape. And we said, uh, something that's been living in somebody's house for over 100 years and looks this good must have something helping him. I know I use under eye cream. Uh, it's, it's a debate at this point as to how much it's helping. But this guy, we suspected he was probably treated with arsenic and our suspicions were correct. The arsenic that was used to help preserve the pelt over time is actually a toxin. And so we had to work with conservators to have him clean so that we could handle him safely. Um, some other of our osteo collections, you could see some of our uh, alligator skeletons, a sawfish bone. We have some corals represented in our collection and uh, of course, we are all always talking about the presence of the exotic invasive Burmese python. See the skin up at the top left. And on the other side, um, depending upon your area of interest, we also collect museum um, objects that are considered to be cultural history. So these types of categories include archaeology, ethnology, history and oral history. Uh, we have a chain mail shirt that's associated with DeSoto National Memorial and the expedition conducted by Hernando DeSoto to explore the Florida Peninsula and up into Louisiana. A fully intact olive jar is in the upper right portion of your screen. This was uh, found off the coast of Biscayne associated with a shipwreck. And we know it was an olive jar because portions of the cork were still intact when it was recovered and there were still olive pits at the bottom of the jar, which I think is pretty cool. You don't find these very often, but this is uh, around 16th century. Um, we believe the dates are associated with that item. Our little um, Mikasuki or Seminole doll down here, she's looking so beautiful bright colors. Some more cultural history items. Uh, down at the bottom right, you can see a scabbard that was uh, associated with the HMS Fowey wreck off the coast of Biscayne National Park. 
And that is a site that uh, the NPS manages on behalf of the, um, the British, uh, emp well, not empire, government, sorry, <laughs> uh, I'm misspeaking there, um, under a, uh, an, a cooperative agreement with the government. Um, you can see some of the canons that we have represented in the collection. You can also see some of the canons in the museum collection out at Fort Jefferson that are actually mounted on top of the fort. Um, Um, here's a little example of some cataloging work that we were doing. I was talking earlier about the really, really painstaking detailed work that we do to keep track of our museum collections. We had a day where we were able to work with a number of um, employees from Biscay National Park and volunteers, and they came over to help us catalog some of the archaeology collections that we had needed to get catalogs so that we could have better accountability for. Um, and uh, you could see some of the types of materials that we we're cataloging that day. You can also see some of the numbers associated with each of these items um, and our good friends hard at work here. Um, but each of these numbers is linked with our database and that's how we keep track of uh, the information associated with uh, each of the items that we held in our, in our collections. Now, this is my personal favorite thing to talk about, uh, the museum's archival um, manuscript and records collections. We have a large historic image collection for Everglades and Dry Tortugas National Parks. Um, and I've actually been working with Clemson University to have our historic image collections hosted online. So they're available to search and research and enjoy um, by anybody who has time to sit and scroll through photographs, which I love. Um, so we have photographic collections represented our collections are primarily textual documents. Uh, they are most often associated with the management of the parks that we serve, just day-to-day -day operational records that are considered to be permanent because they're associated with the management of the park resources over time. We do have audiovisual collections, we have digital electronic collections, and a uh, room that is um, dedicated to housing our oversized maps, plans, and drawings. One of the tools that we use to provide access to our users is something that's called a finding aid. And this is just kind of a summary of the types of records, uh, perhaps may include folder titles for a collection. Um, and it's meant to help a researcher find what they're looking for because walking into a collection that's 30 linear feet of boxes can be pretty overwhelming if you don't have some sort of a direction to get to the box that you're looking for. So this is the tool that we use to help people do that. Again, here's a few more images. These are all taken out at our beautiful Fort Jefferson. The image in the center with the cannon, cannon um, in the middle of the picture is an image of the ordnance removal from Fort Jefferson. Um, when scrap metal was needed for the war efforts, the cannons, most of the cannons and cannonballs from the fort were removed and melted down and repurposed. So this image documents that process. <clears throat> So one of our biggest challenges is that we are working with, by and large, things that had been living at some point in time. When you look at pretty much anything in your house, when you look at a table, you look at anything that's not like man-made from plastic, um, <laughs> we can think about the life that it might have had before. And anything that has the cellulosic characteristics of a living thing or previously living thing has the propensity to be impacted by just general deterioration. Um, so part of our job is trying to keep things from falling apart. And one of the biggest components of that is maintaining a climate um, that is steady in terms of both the temperature and the relative humidity, and also trying to minimize light levels. Now, obviously that's a challenge in South Florida where we have 
90% plus RH outside in our summer months. Um, and uh, so we are always in the process of trying to find the best ways to maintain our relative humidity as stable as possible. Um, we clean and we organize. Uh, it's part of the, the practice of doing curatorial work uh, because even just micro particles can contribute to deterioration. So we try to keep dust levels low and we add multiple layers of protection through boxes or bags or cabinets. Um, and we also try to minimize food sources for pests. So if ever I have someone walk in and they've got their morning donut in their hand, I will say to them very nicely, sir, I'm sorry, or ma'am, you need to leave that outside. <laughs> and um, it just can't come into the museum collection. Uh, but we also do engage in routine monitoring to try to identify if we have any sort of pest activity that's happening in the collection space. <coughs> um, excuse me. Sorry, <coughs> I apologize. So one of the other practices that we engage in, and I mentioned this in terms of this concept of layering, uh, we use quality housing materials. So we use uh, boxes and tissue and sleeves that are very often created in a way that is designed to reduce the amount of acidity in a piece of paper. Um, we try to reduce shock by using cushioning. So we use things um, that are chemically stable when we're selecting foam or padding. Um, and of course we have, we utilize carts to help us transport materials from one place to another. We really try to minimize handling as much as possible. <clears throat> Sometimes I'll get asked by people um, that I work with and just friends and colleagues um, outside of, of work, um, how can I take care of this audio collection that I have from, um, from my grandparents? And sometimes I'll ask, I'll be asked, how do, um, you know, how do I make sure that this isn't going to fall apart? And there are some really, really great resources available through the National Archives on preserving family history um, items. And um, so uh, sometimes it's, it's preferable to seek professional recommendations, um, but it's also a really, really enjoyable uh, undertaking to, um, to set about making sure that whatever is special to you is available for the next generation to enjoy. My mom, personal aside, my mom lost her father when she was a young girl. And uh, um, my grandmother had the letters that my grandfather wrote during the Second World War. And they came to my mother's care. And that was one of the most Special, special collections I've ever worked on because that was my, my grandfather and grandmother's correspondence in the wartime. And, um, you know, we were able to ensure that those items will be available for my son to enjoy some time through the housing work, rehousing work that we did for those and organization work. Ooh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so, is a little bit about what we do, but we are also above and beyond anything else here to help and serve the American public. Um, I have worked with everyone from college students to professors to professional authors, um, interns. We have a really cool program called the Teacher Ranger Teachers, and they are teachers during the year, and then they come and spend the summer months developing interpretive programming, and then they return to being teachers. Um, some of our TRTs are so excited and so engaged to be able to come and experience uh, and work with our, our collections and help um, develop programming around uh, some of those items. We provide support for scientific and historic research. Um, we do have high quality scans of images and documents and some of our herbarium specimens available as well. Um, we help develop educational programs and um, we do have a website that provides information for our access and guidelines for use.
So after the question of what do you do back there, the next most common question I get is, is it digitized? Well, chances are no. <laughs> um, we are working extremely hard to provide digital access to some of our most often requested collections, um, but we maintain over 7 million objects just in the South Florida Collections Management Center. And the high cost of creating a digital surrogate as a access tool is one of our limiting factors, unfortunately. It's a high cost, there's a huge amount of time involved, um, and we don't always have the same return on investment in terms of being able to provide access to every single page in the archives. So if you're ever interested in doing archival research, my recommendation is to start with the finding aid. And from there, we can determine if it is something, if what you're interested in has been digitized or not. If it has, we can, of course, provide access to it in a digital capacity. But if not, an on-site visit would be um, still the traditional approach to using our, our um, archive collections. <clears throat> um, so right now, of course, COVID has impacted our operations um, over time. We're starting to open up on a more limited basis. We're still not doing large tours of collections, um, but I do accommodate uh, individual research requests as I can. Uh, we have a couple of websites listed uh, where you can find more information about the South Florida Collections Management Center. And if you're interested in learning more about our collections, um, the Open Parks Network is where we have been um, hosting our historic photographs. The NPS Museum web portal is where you can find some of those um, uh, virtual exhibits. And the IRMA portal is another access tool that provides um, access to some of our scientific research that's done in the different parks. Um, we are continually working on updating finding aids and um, they are available upon request. Our goal is to get them onto the website, but we are running into some formatting issues. So it's taken some time, but we're working on it. So that is um, what I have to share with all of you for today. So I see some questions in the chat. I will, um, Let's see now. Okay. Yeah, I have five. <laughs> she had some original stamps. Uh huh. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't know if there are serious collectors out there for them. Um, we do have several in our collection, um, but I am not ingrained with the stamp collector world, unfortunately. I apologize. Those would have been uh, of great local interest and also to someone who's a stamp collector, of course. Yeah. Yep. Commemorating, if I understand, Dolly, commemorating the establishment of the of the Everglades uh, National Park in what, 47 or 48, right? 47, yeah. 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 Um, the question about what did I do with my, my grandparents' letters? Um, we ordered some archival boxes and our um, pretty standard praxis, practice is to um, enclose uh, letters that are stable in archival folders and store them vertically within the archival boxes. Um, one of the most important things is to minimize the amount of slumping so that things don't get wrinkled or bent. So trying to make sure that if you have things in a box, they're standing upright and they don't have a whole lot of room to, to wiggle or, or tip over or slouch down in the box. Um, we did use some tissue uh, paper in those collections for um, uh, envelopes that had um, adhesive uh, just to separate that from the letters as well. Um, tell us about your art collection. Um, our art collection is, um, each of our parks has a slightly different art collection, to be honest with you. Um, Biscayne, I'm sorry, Big Cypress National Preserve has a art collection that is the highest volume right now because they've been collecting the art of some of the artists in residence that they have had hosted um, over the course of the last 20 years or so. And so it's a really diverse collection uh, that's a product of the area. Uh, I'm sorry, the artists in residence in Big Cypress. 
um, and their personal experience and interpretation of the space in their residency. Uh, Everglades National Park has one of the, I would say is the next largest artwork collection. Um, we do have um, the image that is um, one that is one of my personal favorites uh, is part of a series by Charlie Harper. And uh, Mr. Harper was commissioned by Everglades National Park to design um, a series of art that served as the model. So he did his work in a, in a much smaller scale. So our pieces are uh, maybe 24 by 24, but they were enlarged um, by the park to like four foot by four foot panels and installed in the old visitor center. So some of you, if you visited the park pre-Hurricane Andrew may have seen those Harper um, panels installed at the visitor center then. Um, but we have the original Harper artwork. Uh, we do have some watercolor um, and uh, we do have a, a significant photograph collection. We have a few pieces by um, Clyde Butcher. Uh, some of the, um, I'm seeing a question about the Harper pieces. Are they among the digitized items available to view online? No, they're not, Ms. Hunt, but if you would like to send me an email or somebody send me an email, I can try to share out the, the digital images of those. Um, and uh, so share out with them. They're, they're really, really cool. Um, and let's see now, we do have some um, oil on canvas as well. Um, so, yeah. And Park is asking if there's a handout. Now, obviously, if we were all together in our usual room at the museum in Coral Gables, a handout would be a lovely thing. Is there a PDF that? I, I have, yes, somebody? and I'd be happy to share that with you, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you add that into the uh, chat link, or, uh, or, or maybe uh, in the chat link, put your email address and somebody yeah. can contact you. I will do uh, that right now. For whatever such, uh, you know, that may, makes sense, so. Yep. <clears throat> I think it's absolutely overwhelming. It's amazing how much material there is and I think that the title of your program is apt because it's all kind of hidden away mm -hmm. and not something that um, the public, you know, is aware of more, more than not, I would say, right? Yeah, and that's one of the, one of the things that we're really trying to, to overcome and, and, you know, just really make it, you know, known that, that we're there, that this is the work that we're doing and, um, and that we're, the work that we're doing is on behalf of the American people. Of course. No, it's, it's just amazing when, when the park service gets started and they say every park should have a museum i mean mm -hmm. that's outrageous what that mm -hmm. alone would cost in terms of resources absolutely and I know the, parks are, the parks are always struggling with resources as as any government agency would yes and yes. so to make that a priority i think is is wonderful yeah. because it, it 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 passes through generations yes uh, it does you know uh, it, you need park benches and you need parking lots and you need all sorts of <laughs> things and you need to maintain your roads but yeah very, I think it's very forward thinking to say that yeah. let's, let's preserve all this because when you think of the unique identity of all these parks and, exactly. and the fact that, that they all are on some land that was somebody's culture mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes at some point right yeah and that and that they were they were preserved for the purpose of not letting it be lost right that all rolls together very very well doesn't it yeah, it, it really does. And, and I think that that's what makes um, the NPS collection, collection so special. You know, most, most museum collections are operating under a scope of collection statement for a particular discipline. Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's contemporary art or if it's an American art collection or something like that, you know, the, the scope is quite narrow. Yeah. Um, but because this as an amalgamation of each of the 
350 plus NPS units, um, you know, we have the opportunity to collect on the behalf of the American people. You know, the Smithsonian collections, of course, have, have a, a wide diversity as well. Um, but because our scope is so closely tied to the enabling legislation of each park, um, you know, we really do have the ability to, to focus a bit more tightly on, on the, the natural and cultural resources associated with that spot, with that space. And of course, you are touching on the origin of parks, for example, uh, with Harry Truman and, and mm -hmm. the origin of the uh, Everglades National Park. And there's yeah. some activity that predates that when the when the Miami Women's Club and the women's clubs around the country gathered yeah. together and saved Royal Palm Park or established it. And they yeah. called it Royal Palm State Park and there were no state parks. So right, they, exactly. They sort exactly. of preceded the whole concept. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and Royal Palm State Park was the land that was eventually became the, the nucleus of, of Everglades National right. Park, the women's club. The, germ, the germinator, if you will. Yeah. But also, you exactly. know, I think, it, I think it had a big impact around the country with women's clubs mm -hmm. to say we could save something. And, and, and I don't know, there's another background story behind that. And that is that when Ingram Highway, you know, was completed all the way from, from uh, Coconut Grove and all the way out to what is Royal Palm Park, mm -hmm. people started going there and stealing the palms. Right. Once, exactly. once they could get there easily. And so mm -hmm. Dade County, the women's club told Dade County, you better put a ranger out there. Mm -hmm. And Dade County said that would cost $17 a month. I don't think that's <laughs> possible. And, yeah. and they said, you just do it. Yeah. So, well, in the, in the period of time between when Everglades National Park, when the idea was first, you know, passed by Congress, and then it wasn't established until many years later, yeah. um, there were still efforts undertaken to try to protect and preserve the space. And so Daniel Beard, uh, who was the park's first superintendent, wrote a report in 1938 documenting the resources and what would be needed to protect them. Um, and uh, we're, we're leading up to the 75th anniversary of Everglades National Park. We have a yeah. big anniversary coming up. And um, one of the projects that I've been working on with my team has been developing some um, social media posts about the park history. So Wonderful. if y'all don't follow us, please look for us because we're doing weekly Throwback Thursday um, posts about the history of Everglades National Park. So if That's you're interested wonderful. in learning some cool little tidbits, we're trying to do the deep dive and really get into the, some of those stories that aren't told all the time. So we'd love to have some extra followers. Now, I think that 1938 report mm -hmm. of what resources would be necessary. Yeah. You know, wow, that's a, that's a real seminal piece of paper there. It uh, is. In it terms is. Of, uh, of actually the, 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 the size and scope and what it would take. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, that, that, that'd be a very interesting document to peruse, I think. Oh, absolutely. Um, my, my email is, is listed there. So if there yeah. are specific things that y'all are thinking of and listing, I, I do have that digitized. Um, so I could send that over. I don't, I can't speak to the quality of it. It was uh, scanned a few years ago, but um, it can certainly be a touch point. Well, if it's readable, I think that's the it thing. Is. And the fact yeah. that it's preserved, amen, that's the first thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and it's funny to, to follow that timeline to mm -hmm. see how we got there. And just as another background, you know, in 1904, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward was elected governor of Florida. Mm -hmm. and he just had a simple platform. Let's drain the Everglades. Right. We, can, we can grow tomatoes. And, and he yeah. showed some big giant tomatoes that, you know, like, look at, you know, just first of all, we get rid of the mosquitoes and the alligators and malaria. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so much land out there. And, uh, you know, this is going to be great. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, you know, meanwhile, the women's club was saying, no, let's preserve this. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and so thank goodness it isn't all homes, you know? Oh, for sure. I mean, when you think about some of the, the ironies associated with this place and, you know, the, from, from that mindset, um, just yeah. over a hundred years ago to where we are now, and we've been banging our heads in a wall, trying to, trying to fix the water and get the water right. And, yeah. um, has spent how many millions of dollars doing so. I mean, it's, it's a yeah, major, major undertaking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you're never done, you know, you don't just go, okay, Everglades is saved, we're done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there's all these competing fractions that need mm -hmm. to have their consideration. Yeah. And interestingly, there's still a few home sites out there that were grandfathered in, and, and some of that stuff is interesting. Then there's the whole mm -hmm. airboat community and, mm -hmm. and the swamp buggy people and, and, yeah. and Loop Road and all that stuff. It's just such a rich 
rich, you know, bunch of information. It really is. It and, really is. I had no idea you had this archive. And so I, I just think when we found out about you and, and the archive, I thought this would be something that's an eye opener for people. And yeah, I'm so glad absolutely. you could be with us today. Now, well, thank you so much questions? for having me. Yeah. Let's have some more questions. Anybody? Frank, you always have a question. Uh, where are the bodies buried? Frank wants to know. No. <laughs> We don't bury <laughs> bodies in the Everglades. No, that doesn't happen. No, no. no. Okay. no that was a different um, movie. No. <laughs> I, you know what? There's um, one of the things that I think is kind of cool that people don't know about the National Park Service operations is that, um, you know, if there are wildlife strikes, um, they, they let the wild take over, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of management that's done. Right. We don't interfere with nature right. um, with, uh, you know, if there's, if there's a, an animal fatality, we let nature run its course. Right. No, that's smart. It's been working for, you know, eons so far. So yeah, exactly. We live with that. I mm -hmm. remember as a kid being out in the Everglades, my mother was a, a, a ardent bird watcher. And so uh, there would be times where at, at dusk, the sky was black with birds. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was just millions of birds looking for a place to roost as they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll go from a feeding area, you know, to to a roosting area. Mm -hmm. and just overwhelming the amount of life is out there. And as I understand it, from looking back, we're probably down to ten percent of the original wild bird population in the Everglades. Is that an accurate number? Do you know? <laughs> I, you know what? I wish my science was good enough to give you a reliable answer. Unfortunately, I, I don't know where we are right now. I'm sorry. Well, all the collecting of plumage and stuff, which was mm. all the rage, mm -hmm. I think estimated a lot of bird population, but then Absolutely. also environmental. Yeah, uh, yeah. We then, had a really good uh, breeding season out at the Paradis Pond, I think about two years ago. Um, so I know that the park managers were very excited about that. That was some of the biggest breeding bird numbers that we'd seen in quite so some So that would have been the spoonbill and such and some of the big birds? Yeah, the wading birds. Mm -hmm. And I understand now that, that uh, flamingos are returning to Florida. I mean, there was at some point in the natural era in the back, uh, <laughs> in, you know, the Floridian flamingo. Uh, yeah. You know, there's the West, West Indian flamingo. Florida and, flamingo. And the Florida flamingo is now maybe on the comeback. Have you heard anything? Uh, I, I've heard of like one or two sightings. So I don't know if any of the scientists or managers would say that a comeback is imminent. Right. Um, I've heard of a few sightings. But yeah. again, there's probably someone who's running that data who knows better than I do. And their environment is very specific. I mean, they like shallow salt areas. Yeah, they exactly. They build up their little mounds for their, for their, each one builds a mound with one egg in it, I think. Yeah, and, it's very uh, cool. Uh, it's, it's really a, a fabulous, I mean, uh, the lore of flamingos is fabulous. I mean, uh, who mm -hmm. doesn't have a pink flamingo in their garden? I mean, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I mean, they have them in New Jersey, for God's sakes. I mean, they're everywhere, pink flamingos, right? So Yeah. I, 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 oh, Helen yeah. asked a great question about the pythons. Um, yes, the pythons have had an impact on everything. Um, one of our scientists came to me once and said, I need everything you had on the small mammal populations in the parks because we he wanted to know what the numbers were and where they are now so small mammal populations have been almost decimated i mean people talk about seeing um you know little rodents and things that they just don't see out there now squirrels and um, um. Otters, yeah, exactly. Um, rabbits. Um, so that has absolutely been an impact. Um, one of our scientists, well, actually now it's, <laughs> it's several generations down in science. Um, the pythons have been studied uh, for, for, you know, many, many years now. And I think that we just passed the 30 year mark of when they were first identified. Um, the very, very first sighting. Um, but we have in the collections represented um, gut samples of the pythons because they wanted to know what they were eating. They were eating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, of course, we have um, skins and 
bones, um, ortheo collections of, um, of different snakes. We don't collect every single one, but there have been a few um, specific uh, individuals that we have um, maintained, the, the largest specimens at the time, but they have gotten bigger since then. So the, the one that we have um, actually mounted um, <clears throat> was, was collected in 2009, um, and we've had bigger snakes since then. Um, it is a tough yeah. thing when you think of how many, for all good intentions, you know, reptile mm -hmm. collectors, you know, <laughs> when, once it got easy to bring all of the uh, lizards and parrots and, yeah. and, you know, pets, you know, from everywhere around the world, some of them do extremely well here. Um, I can look out of my backyard at any time and see African, you know, lizard, you know, fighting with a, you know, yeah. a Brazilian lizard. And, you know, I think, I think those, those reptile importers. We're continually, can the parks continually monitoring tegu activity on the boundary yeah. of the park. Yeah. That's because another that's one a that's, big, that's a big effect there. Huh? That's a big mm -hmm. lizard. Is that what that is? Yep. Yeah. Another exotic invasive species. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. I have a I have a question um, <laughs> to ask, uh, and that is, um, uh, do you have like a, a entry port that um, uh, a person that would be new to the park could say, I want to visit this area? What do you have in that area? For instance, if they want to go see Anhinga Trail, mm -hmm. uh, what what uh, what have you collected over the the history the science, the whatever have you, that has to do with Anhinga Trail. Uh, it seems to me that this would be a way to get um, novices interested in the mm -hmm. different collections that you have, mm -hmm. and because then they could go visit there, and they've, mm -hmm. they've already read the stuff online, mm -hmm. and, and uh, this would be an entree, what, what they should look for when they go there. That's easy. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, and that's actually something that I'll, I'll pause it. We're working on um, doing some updates to the park's websites. Um, and I think it would be really cool to get some more of that, of that history um, about each of our, of our locations um, available through the park's website. So I could certainly mention that at our, our next get together. Oh, well, good. I have yeah. another question. Do you have sure. the pers personnel that worked in the park from uh, day one uh, on, but we collected that. Some, and that's been loosely cobbled together. Um, we are in the process of um, actively collecting oral histories with park staff that have a significant tenure, 10 years or more, um, who have had the capacity to um, see change over time and really, um, you know, uh, make a connection with how um, park management has perhaps changed over time. Um, so that's, that's one way that we are, um, you know, putting forth an effort to document the, uh, the, the personal history um, of our past employees. We do have like a running spreadsheet um, just an Excel document, which we use primarily as a tool um, when we're trying to do some of our, our cataloging work, um, which mainly consists of, you know, if we have dates of tenure, position, name, um, their, their title, uh, and if they've changed roles um, over the course of time. Um, but we have a lot of seasonal employees um, that are really hard to track down. We, we do a staff turnover um, every summer pretty much for our interpretive staff that is not permanent. So most of the people on that list have had a longer um, association with the park. And you are coming up on the 30th anniversary of Andrew, which I think had to be mm. one, of the, uh, one of the big changeable moments in the history of the park. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I have said for years that we noticed the biggest gaps in our archival timeline in the months and years immediately following Andrew. Yeah. Um, 
and the records right before Andrew, because that's what was in people's offices. Um, so yes, it, it absolutely did have an impact on the park. Um, everything from, you know, how the park responds to hurricanes. Um, our preparations have developed over time, just in terms of how we are, um, how we prepare for, for a potential storm impact. Um, to, you know, we, we had buildings that were lost entirely um, after Andrew. And, um, you know, those of course have since been rebuilt like so much of South Florida. Um, but the, uh, <clears throat> the, yeah, it's, um, it's I, I've noticed that we just don't have a consistent um, lineage of records around that time frame. It might be interesting sure with, with the lodge at Everglades coming back. Um, mm. uh, 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 old photos there of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, you know, that, that really has been a legendary spot way down there at the end of the road. At uh, Flamingo? At Flamingo. And, yeah. And, uh, and now with it coming back, it would be wonderful. And, and I suppose they will have old photos in the lodge, uh, things like that. And that will probably come from your collection then, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I've been part of the uh, the exhibit design team um, for the new visitor center, um, and and our focus has been on documenting the um, the the former flamingo residents um, and their lives and livelihoods within the park. Um, so we we made sure that that story was being told. We've also um, you know made efforts to ensure that um, the the native the Seminole story and Miccosukee are tribal partners, um, that their story is, is captured as part of this exhibit as well. Um, in the, uh, the, the, the new lodging and um, um, restaurant, their um, operations are managed privately. So in terms of their decor, I, I don't know as intimately what they're planning to do with that. So that's a concession that's, Correct. that's uh, mm -hmm. you know, given to somebody and they do that what yeah. they want. Yeah. They oh, might have old photos. I don't know. <laughs> I see that Enid is with us. Enid, it's always so nice to see you. And and uh and uh, is that a painting that you're that's your background? It looks very nice. Looks like a little house on the bay or something from the Bahamas. You can there you uh, go. can you hear me? Yeah we can hear you. Okay, uh, that's my house in uh, Exuma. There you go. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, what are you doing here then? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Well, the, my, my problem is that I'm on dialysis. There you go. And, and they don't have it there. They, they don't have that so, there, no. So. No, so I'm stuck. <laughs> but yeah, you got to stick close to the machine, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah. Three well, times nice, a week. Nice to see you today, as always, Edith. <laughs> Now more questions. Anybody? Uh, anybody have a? Oh, I see one about the pythons. Oh, okay, good. Yes. <clears throat> what is Park Service doing to curb the python population within the boundaries? Um, the efforts that the Park Service has done over the years has really been, I, I find, very interesting and very innovative. Um, some have worked sort of, some have not. <laughs> um, when I first started working at the park 15 years ago, one of my first days on the job, I was called into a room by one of our long-term volunteers. And she said, come here, you have to see this. And I said, okay, what are we doing? And she said, they've got the different divisions from Fish and Wildlife, and they are inserting a radio tracking device under the skin of a Burmese python. Wow. And I said, oh, and I walked in and I was standing in a room and they had two eight foot long folding tables lined up end to end and a snake that was anesthetized by a, a veterinarian sitting right there on the table. And whole group of scientists lined up around the tables and I had just snuck into this room. And when they started the process of inserting the, the little uh, radio tracking device, the snake started to come out of the anesthesia and I was standing by the head and it went, oh. <laughs> 
and she started to move a bit. And I just was amazed at the, the musculature of this creature. I have never seen anything like that. And, um, you know, they, the veterinarian of course was, was quick to respond and she was fine. And, um, but it was, uh, it was really, really interesting to see how many agencies were represented at this table, literally at this table, um, working on this problem. And they, um, they released this female snake back out into the wilderness and tracked her movements, trying to see where she was going, what she was doing. Um, and at times when she was sitting on a clutch, they were able to intercede, remove the males that would gather around her. Um, they have brought in another strategy was to bring in snake hunters from India um, mm -hmm. to try to, you know, share some of their strategies and techniques. The challenge is that the Everglades is a ecosystem that is not very hospitable to humans and is much more comfy for snakes. And it's really, really hard to see them. And it's over the, you know, 1.5 million acres in Everglades alone. And then they're up in Big Cypress too. Um, they do a really good job of hiding and they've also found that they burrow down. Uh, so it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. Uh, I know that the park had been utilizing a um, a python, and this was many years ago, I want to say around 2006, um, a python who was trained to sniff out, I'm sorry, a beagle that was trained to sniff out pythons. I'm so sorry. Um, so Python Pete was uh, a little mascot dog for a little while there, but Pete retired. Um, and uh, I know that another study was being done recently with um, pheromones, um, trying to attract um, snakes to each other using using natural pheromones. So um, I'm not sure on where things stand right now, um, but one of the, the major um, things that the park does is education about exotic invasive species. Mm. Um, I know there are there's a social media campaign, I think it's called I Got One or I Found One, something like that, um, where you can report um, observing a, um, a snake um, and, and take use as well, I believe they're, they're documenting it too. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's a lot of different strategies. They're really they're trying. So, so when, when um, a researcher comes to do research yeah. there, do you mm -hmm. sign an agreement with them so that they give you all their their research finding, their published papers and things like that. Is there a way to make sure you're getting all this that occurs? And do you do periodic searches of the literature to see what you missed? So that's a great question. Um, if I am working with a researcher um, who is just coming in, like if I'm working with a professor at a university, most of what they are using is our public records um, because they're, they're created in the course of, of doing government work. Um, so if it's something that is in the public domain, um, they're able to use what they want as part of their, their publication. Um, on the other side of that, we do have scientific research that is permitted within the Park Service and some of the conditions of those scientific research permits are that the NPS is the owner of um, any research that is conducted within the park and specimens that are collected within the park. We work with other repositories to maintain loans of those specimens sometimes. Sometimes the specimens come directly to us for management, um, but the end deliverable of those research projects, um, be it data or reports or um, photographs, um, yes, they are required to, to become part of the NPS collections. And yes, I spend a tremendous amount of time trying to track that down. <laughs> Well, I might suggest that uh, there's uh, been a lot of publications that may not have come to you. Mm. And, and uh, when you get a college student that's familiar with research, they should be able to do um, you know, nationwide, uh, mm -hmm. worldwide research 
uh, on uh, certain keywords. Mm -hmm. And you might find things out there that you could add a, a link to that research in your archive. Yeah, um, one of the other places that our scientists are required to submit is to the NPS RPRS website. Um, and that's the, the research permit RP. I forget the, what it stands for. Um, but that's, that's where you can find that type of, of scientific research. Um, they're supposed to do it, whether or not it happens. Is, that's a condition of their permit. It is. It's too tight to work. Yeah. <laughs> it is, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, now and we do we use some. Um, Go ahead, sorry. When we come and visit the uh, the Everglades National Park, is there a way to visit the archives? Archives visits um, are by appointment. So reaching out to me if you have a particular, um, you know, research interest or need, um, we can get something scheduled. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, this I would love to uh, thank everybody for showing up today and for engaging in I think what is a really eye opening conversation with Bonnie about what happens over there at the National Park Archives. And uh, we are very, uh, I, I think, lucky indeed to have uh, so many national parks right here with us. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, just in Dade County, I think, I think we're the only county with two national parks. I think there's there's another one, and I don't remember is which there? it is. Okay. I think it's out west somewhere. But I, I, I have heard that claim to fame as well. So I think we can own it and make it ours yeah. Yeah. until they tell me otherwise right no. yeah exactly so again thank you so much bonnie for being with us today thanks everybody for showing up of course thank the program you all. Is available later on uh 